I have the pleasure of talking about Crowley and Thelema, which are subjects I absolutely love, with scholar, researcher, and lecturer Colin Campbell. Today, I'll be focusing the conversation around his book, Thelema, an introduction to the life, work, and philosophy of Aleister Crowley. Llewellyn was kind enough to send me this copy, so thank you, Llewellyn. Uh, Colin's work also includes a concordance uh, to the holy books of Thelema, the magic seal of Dr. John Dee, the Sigillum de Ameth, and of the art Goetia. So welcome, Colin. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Before we get deep into Crowley, could you please introduce yourself and talk about your background? Sure. Th and thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I really look forward to having this conversation. Uh, again, uh, my name is Colin Campbell. Uh, I've studied or, or have had an interest in magic since I was probably 15 years old. So that should tell you just how cool I was in high school. Uh, it really kind of continued into college where um, I found a, a, a book that never should have been there, uh, <laughs> which is a, a very limited edition uh, volume of uh, angel magic that just you know happened to sit in the library and obviously that piqued my interest and that's kind of when I started going down the rabbit hole for real I spent probably the first at least decade of my my practice uh kind of in a golden dawn uh magical current uh and it wasn't later until later until I was uh, frankly ready to kind of approach the lima um that I really kind of went down that particular rabbit hole and that's that's where I spent the last uh you know, well, many, many years, so. Yeah, that's very cool. Same with me, around 15, 16 was when I started to get into the occult. So it's it's cool to see those similar stories there. Great. Um, how, did, how did you first discover Crowley and what made you decide to study his work more closely? So if you're really studying magic, uh, especially kind of more of the, the you know, post Golden Dawn or Golden Dawn and forward, because the Golden Dawn really kind of changed the game around what we look at magic as. Um, there's a distinction between the Golden Dawn's, uh, you know, view of magic was very syncretic um, and say the grimoire traditions and whatnot. So they're, they're, they're very, very different. But um, especially if you get into magic as we sort of know it today, you're going to come across Aleister Crowley. There's, there's, he's, he's <laughs> love him or hate him. Uh, you, you can't avoid him. And so you've got to figure out what that's about. And, and I think when I first encountered him, I knew that he was um, both brilliant and truly understood magic at a deeper level than I, I felt like anybody else was writing at. But I, <laughs> didn't have enough knowledge to really get into that uh, at that time. There just wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of resources available commonly um, to kind of help that along. So uh, that's, that's, you know, when I, when I finally kind of got to a point where uh, it was actually a friend of mine uh, recommended him again, said, you really need to start reading Crowley. Uh, and I, I took that suggestion and uh, took off from there. So. Oh, that's fantastic. And what a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> right. What inspired you to write this book on Thelema? You mentioned like there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, good stuff out there today on Crowley. And this is one of the books that weren't around back then. But what was your inspiration for it? Uh, oddly enough, uh, so I, I've published uh, all of the books you had mentioned before through a, through another publishing uh, house. Uh, and, and I sort of had my publisher for the works that I, I need to do. And I, I don't necessarily write anything for an audience beyond myself. I really do any of my writing projects is really kind of research because I'm interested in this and it would be cool to kind of put together a, a work on it. And you know I've had the good fortune of, of having people want to be you know want to publish that. Uh, in this instance, it was actually somewhat different. I, I had uh, and a, the publish one of the people from the well and approach me and say, hey, if you'd like to publish something through us, uh, we think that would be great. Uh, and my initial reaction was, I don't really think I have anything that would would work for you. Um, and that's, you know, that's just didn't have anything on the on the stove. But I had been toying with the idea of writing an introductory work on Thelema. I thought that would be fun. Um, one of the things that writing does for you is it really exposes the gaps in your knowledge. 
Uh, and so part of the the work for me when I'm when I'm writing is okay, what what don't I really understand here? Um, or in this case, it was specifically around how can I how can I write this clearly enough that someone who doesn't have a background in this can not only understand it, uh, but find more resources to continue that work and, and kind of grow in, in their exploration of Thalema. Yeah, that's So fantastic. that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> very cool, very cool. I'm so glad the yeah. publisher reached out to you to write that book because it is such a great resource. I feel like anyone can pick up that book and get started. And it explores so many different angles of Thalema and gives you the tools to understand it and branch off from there. So something I really enjoyed about your book is that you talk very directly about Thelemic organizations, including the OTO, and its primary public ritual, the Gnostic Mass. For someone just getting started, this is such valuable information and something that we don't see in a lot of other Thelema-related books, even intro books. What made you decide to include this particular information, and what do you hope the readers get out of it? Uh, well, first, thank you for, for, for all your kind words. <laughs> I really, <laughs> really do appreciate it. Uh, I'm honest. I, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, I really, you know, in, in writing this, uh, as you, you sort of pointed out, I really wanted something that would have been helpful to me uh, in, in my initial exploration, because the corpus of work around Aleister Crowley, just his own writings alone is, is massive. Um, and, uh, you know, his views changed over time as well. So like, what is, what does the Lima mean? Well, and it's such, it's such an individualistic concept of what the Lima is. Like it's, it's up to us to really define all of that. Um, so, you know, what I wanted to include in the book, uh, were, were really kind of what I felt were the core elements, uh, around, around, Thelema as a, a religion, as a philosophy, uh, and then the practices that surround all of that, right? So uh, with, you know, some level of kind of introduction to who is Aleister Crowley uh, in there as well. For those who uh, don't, you know, haven't read any of the larger biographies of which there are several very good ones. Um, so including things like the OTO and the Gnostic Mass, um, I'll, I'll touch on those specifically because the OTO being kind of the the, the magical legacy of Aleister Crowley or, or the organizational legacy of Aleister Crowley really is a, a place where people, provided that there is a, a body of OTO in their general vicinity, can go and meet with other people who are really doing the work of Thelema. And including the Gnostic Mass in this, uh, because that's often the first thing they see. Um, and so it, it is... Again, the, the central public and private ritual of, of the OTO, and there are a number of very Thelemic concepts embedded therein. Um, and so as a as an introduction, I felt like it would be empty without it. Uh, and uh, it was it, it needed to be there <laughs> along with some of the other pieces as well, right? Obviously, there's a magical piece and the philosophical piece. Um, you know, the 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 Gnostic Mass under the auspices of, of Ecclesia Gnostic Catholica, which is, is part of the OTO, um, really embodies kind of that religious sense or aspect. Uh, and a lot of people really enjoy that piece. And to to leave it out would have been uh, a mortal sin if there is such a thing. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And something I reflect on too is, or at least reflecting on my journey when I first got started, is we do approach this, you know, we approach the philosophy, the magic, the mysticism angle. But I think there does come to a part in people's journey or path where they're like, wow, I'm ready to do stuff in a group. I want that group ritual experience. Or they're asking themselves, hey, what were the rituals that Crowley wrote actually like? And the OTO provides a space and a venue to explore these things. And uh, for someone, again, who doesn't know anything about that is interested, I think it's really cool to have that in a book just right there and easily accessible. So just from a purely user standpoint, I think it's fantastic that it's in there. Well, well thank you. And, and you're you're absolutely right in in everything you've just, just said and, and probably better than I, I might have said it. Um, it can be daunting for someone to just walk into a room full of strangers, right? Much less in this sort of context. Uh, and, and so part of what I had hoped to do is say, hey, it's okay. You can go. It's it's friendly. Um, and a Gnostic Mass is, it is a participatory ritual, but it is 
it's it's a celebration. And I tell this to people before Gnostic Masses when, when I'm there saying, enjoy it. It's a celebration. You're not expected to know everything about it. Day one, walking in the door. If you know absolutely nothing, that's okay. Experience it. What does it say to you? And and go from there. If you want to dive you know, deeper than, than there's certainly all the time in the world to do that. Um, but including, you know, OTO and, and specifically the Gnostic mass, that was part of, uh, why I wanted to do that just to say, it's okay. You can, you can come. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. And that's fantastic. And one, one aspect, so I've been, um, of course, very active in my pagan community and I've been giving talks mm -hmm. at various pagan events and stuff. But one thing that really excited me was hearing from the Wiccan perspective, um, how excited Wiccans were to come to the Gnostic Mass, even if they don't identify with the term Thelemite. Um, but just they were aware of the fact that Gerald Gardner, for example, drew inspiration from the Gnostic Mass and included that in some of his um, magic and rituals and initiations that he wrote. And so they've found value that in that as well. And so I always tell people, you don't have to be a Thelemite to come, although it does help. <laughs> right. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and, as, absolutely right. And, and it really is, uh, if you... If, you, if you're not quite there yet in terms of saying, I, I'm not sure about the Lima. Um, I, and and one, on one sense, you, you have to be sure about the Lima because the Lima is just your will. It's who you are. And, yeah. But that's independent of an organization centered around the Lima. Those are very different things, right? You can be the best Thelemite in the world and not belong to any organization whatsoever. And so, however, it's nice to have friends. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, other people who are kind of doing the work in a similar way with a, a similar language around it, uh, I think is very important. So definitely, definitely. Are there particular areas or aspects of the lemma that you didn't cover extensively in your book, but find fascinating or important for readers to explore further? Sure. Uh, I think one I, I touched on but didn't really go into was the AA, which uh, if the OTO is kind of the social wing of of, of the uh, of Thelema, the AA is really much the individual solitary practice uh, branch. And so I did not go into that very much other than mentioning, hey, it exists. <laughs> go, go check it out if you're interested, uh, because I don't think I'm the right person to say that, uh, to, to really expound upon it. And so I didn't go there. Uh, I, I think I could have done more with Ecclesia Gnostica and Catholica. Uh, and I, while, I, while I detailed the mass and, and sort of at a high level what it's about, I, uh, I didn't quite delve into the difference between, for example, OTO and EGC. Uh, and so that might be one I'd go over. And then, then lastly, I think because it was going to be likely too much, uh, Crowley in, in Magic, book four, uh, really goes through a set of magical postulates that I think are really, really important. Uh, the, the most well-known of which is that magic is the art and science of causing change in accordance with will, right? So that's, that's what is magic? Okay, it's that. It's causing change. Um, but as you go further into these, these postulates and you know, these really magical aphorisms, um, you, you get more fine grain detail and what he means by all of that. Um, you know, the second one being largely around, you, you can only affect change through the, the, using the proper force through the proper medium at the proper time on the proper subject and so on and so forth. Um, which if you think about, you know, everything, <laughs> like just everyday life, that's, that's true. Um, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm going to buy an ice cream, I need to leverage the right amount of money at the right storefront at the right time to get my ice cream. Uh, and so that's, that's, you know, as simple as it gets and it's, it's real. And I think a lot of the postulates do make magic real and effective, uh, and anything outside of them, just, it, it's impossible to do so. And, and it's, it's a very healthy approach, uh, to keep you kind of focused and grounded and, and doing the right things in the right way. So those are, those are probably three things that I might've expounded on further, but, uh, many of them were either just outside the scope of of where I felt I should speak to, uh, or just outside of the scope of the work, because you could do an entire work on on, on Crowley's you know magical postulates, and you know, maybe that will be one in the future. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Put it up. That's on my wish list. <laughs> I would love that. Okay. Um, but and, and to sort of return back to what you said about the AA, you know, that's obviously a really important um, aspect of Crowley, and that's his teaching order he developed, and. 
I think for some people, like you said, it's, it's, it's can be a minefield to navigate. And I think because it's such a minefield, a lot of people, at least in my experience, shy away from even talking about it. And, um, and, and then if it does come up, it's just sort of like this giant nuclear explosion. You're like, I don't know what's happening, especially as a beginner. Like you have no idea. I remember when I was, I was just a little infant looking the, about trying to look up this stuff, look, learn about the AA, like mm-hmm. what are the different, you know, options out there, different AA lineages. And it was just so like, it was just a minefield. And I think it's really cool in this book that you do keep it clear and concise. You provide the information that people could need to like continue further if they want to. Um, and I, I just wish uh, that information was more out there in terms of being clear and concise and like, boom, here's what you need. Do what you need to do. So appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. I, I mean, it, it can be confusing, especially, you know, if you get, you know, there, there are a number of uh, what, what used to be lineages. I think people want to refer to them as claimancies or claimants sure. to AA. Yeah. Um, it's, same, it's the same thing to me. So it's there, there are a number of people who were in AA and, uh, and now have uh, either students or, or what, there's, there's some branch, right? And that's going to happen. Yeah. Of course it is. Uh, you had Crowley, who was, you know, started effectively in, in at least physically, you know, in practical terms, um, had a number of students and then Crowley passes, then what, right? So you have a number mm-hmm. of people who were involved and okay, that's, that's natural. Um, and I don't, don't disparage um, any of them. Uh, I'm a magician. So here's my cat. Uh, hi, oh, buddy. Oh, so cute. <laughs> this is Dexter. Hey, uh, Dexter. Ex- the real, the real star of the show. Uh, conversation oh he will now be the next star of the show so um <laughs> yeah, people people are gonna like like search this video like oh this is the point i'm gonna right. stop and look at right where the cat is <laughs> all right buddy here we go um hello everybody this is dexter so dexter <laughs> is not a claimant of aa he is uh just a cat but he's, wor- he's working on it though but so. he's he's yes deep in meditation most days uh <laughs> so <laughs> where were we oh yeah um it can be uh, as you noted, there's, there are a number of different lineages and and then people, well, am I in the right one? I don't know. And, uh, I'm not going to make that judgment. Yeah. I'm just not. And and that's kind of how I left it in the book as well. And I like that. And I think that really gives the trust to the reader to like make up their own mind. So you're not really selling an argument. You're just giving the reader the information, allowing them to make up their minds. Right. Which yeah. I think is and good. That, that really was, uh, in writing the book, I tried very, very hard not to interject my own kind of thoughts and opinions uh, as so as to kind of taint the thoughts and opinions of others. That might be another book at some other time where I clearly say, this is my thing. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I tried to keep everything in reference to something Crowley said. And, and really quote Crowley as, as, as frequently as possible in making the statements I was making in the book so that it was not Colin speaking about what he believes Thelema is. It's Crowley speaking about what he believes Thelema is, which in and of itself <laughs> you know, depends on the day. Um, but that was that was really key for me to, to provide something that was a good stepping stone uh, for beginners uh, in, in who want to explore about Thelema and really going back to source material with touch points to have them go explore further because there's no way you can write a a single book that encompasses everything about this any more than you could write a single book about any magical practice or religion or philosophy um which you know depending on your your point of view uh, Thelema is one or more of all of those um you, you just can't do it right so I didn't try to. <laughs> That's kind yeah, of what came down. Absolutely. To. Yeah, absolutely. So what was the hardest part of writing this book? Getting up at six in the morning. Probably getting up at six in the morning. Uh, <laughs> no, I, honestly, I think we we just touched on it. It was making sure that if I wrote something, I was writing it with Crowley's voice in mind. Uh, you know, his words in in my in my mouth to my pen, I guess, or keyboard that's I guess that's what, how we do it now um and not just being very very careful not to interject my own uh thoughts or opinions as much as possible I 
I managed a few things here and there, but uh, by and large, I tried to just support everything with Crowley's words and uh, pulling directly from Crowley's works uh, to supply the some of the fodder for the for the book and leaving my own kind of opinions and thoughts out. That was hard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm going to take like a quick turn in a slightly different direction. And I'm honestly asking this question more for myself because I'm really interested in this subject. So sure. um, I, I, I think a lot of the viewers out here are really excited to hear something fresh too um, in terms of this work you did. But uh, talking more broadly about your work, could you share the importance of the Adam Cottage where Crowley stayed oh. and the detective work you did identifying and locating it? Sure, happy to. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, part of what I like to do is like to be able to touch history, right? And 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 really kind of see if you, you know, Crowley was British. He spent uh, most of his, well, most of his life in Europe anyway, but he did spend some time in the United States. And that's for, for a person who uh, lives in the Northeast, um, you know, what's, what's tangible? Well, he spent time in New York. I can go to New York and visit places in New York. Um, and there was one uh, particular summer of 1916 where Alistair Crowley spent the summer uh, in a cottage in New Hampshire. And uh, I thought I could, I could definitely get there. So everyone that uh, is aware of the Adams cottage. Uh, so out of the, we, the Adams college cottage after Evangeline Adams, who was actually a very, very influential and popular astrologer, uh, you have astrology in the newspapers because of Evangeline Adams. Uh, she was she was very successful as uh, an astrologer. She had a very unique um, and interesting uh, method of doing astrology that took uh, not only the the person's natal chart but also the current astrological conditions, kind of overlaid them, and that was how she did her astrology. And Crowley met her in New York. Uh, and obviously traveling in, in the same circles. Crowley had never really done an exposition of astrology. He, he hadn't really done a book on it, for example. Uh, and Evangeline Adams hadn't either. Uh, but when Crowley you know, started talking about uh, astrology with her, he, he realized she really didn't have any idea how it worked, right? Uh, I, I think she, like he said it's something like she, she had thought the universe was uh, like uh, raisins in a pudding or something, just kind of the planets were all about, not really putting it together with the actual physical uh, positionings of the planets and things like that. So he volunteer, volunteered or they came to an agreement where he would ghostwrite uh, a book on astrology on her behalf. Um, and that became uh, two books later on uh, from Evangeline Adams, which were uh, Your Place in the Sun and Your Place Among the Stars, I believe, are the, the two works that, that she published, largely, uh, almost almost totally Crowley's writing. Uh, even all the personages that are, are mentioned in them are European personages, right? If, if you're doing a horoscope, it's for Napoleon or Churchill, not George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, right? Like those would be much more American horoscopes to go after. Um, but he was, he, they were published uncredited. Um, and so those have since been released uh, in a book called The General Principles of Astrology by Crowley and Adams uh, collectively uh, in recognition of the fact that the work really was Crowley's. Um, so uh, they meet in New York. This is getting longer winded by the moment, but we're getting there, I promise. Uh, <laughs> Crowley meets Adams in New York, agrees to do this ghostwriting project. Um, but New York is a really fun town. And uh, Crowley's, Crowley's enjoying it. And the work isn't really moving along as fast as, as Adams would like it to. Um, so uh, as the, the legend has it, she invites him to use her cottage uh, uh, in New Hampshire on what is, uh, what is referred to as Lake Pasquany, what's actually Newfound Lake in New Hampshire. And uh, Pasquany at the time was kind of the, the local popularized um, uh, version kind of trying to tie it back to the indigenous roots of uh of the lake's naming which is you know it was kind of a spurious association anyway but it was was kind of picked up by a local historian who wanted to name the otherwise meaningless newfound lake because they'd found it long, a long time ago uh, so Crowley goes up in the summer of 1916 and uh he does do a lot of writing up there but there are a lot of other important pieces 
um, including, uh, he writes a number of uh, his detective stories, the Simon If series, uh, which he had uh, done a number of stories on and published in uh, Vanity Fair and, and other places. And um, he had he did some a lot of meditation and, and magical work up there as well. And the cottage that has to date been identified, or, or at least until I started doing some legwork on it, uh, is in Hebron, New Hampshire, which is on the northern side of the lake. Uh, and it's a beautiful uh, former parsonage for the church that sits next door. And it's a you know white picket fenced, uh, very idyllic, right on the town commons um, sort of place. And so uh, if you go on to places like Atlas Obscura and things like that, that is what you will see. You'll see the, the Crowley, you know, Adams cottage and it's that, but it's, I went to go visit it just like anyone might, I guess. And many do. Um, but based on all of the, the information that I had read about uh, Crowley's experience of the cottage uh, and, and what he did there, it just didn't line up to me. Um, he said, you know, he said it was about 150 yards. Uh, he had made it 150 yardish dash to the, the waterfront and, and whatnot. Um, and it, this isn't close to the water. Uh, he does also doesn't mention the, either a church next door or a, or a town commons or the graveyard right behind it. Right. Like these yeah. things he probably would have written about. Uh, and so that got me really thinking, this doesn't make sense. Right. And so I I went and looked at, all right, can I make this make sense? Right. He he describes uh pieces of of the cottage as well in various writings. Um and it didn't work. Uh so I ended up uh driving uh quite a distance through the wilds of New Hampshire, uh to the the county seat, which is in Grafton, New Hampshire. It's it's actually right up near um, say Burlington, Vermont. And so it's actually pretty close to Burlington. And was able to go through probate records. Uh, and it turns out uh, that her brother, Evangeline Adams' brother, had died in 1915 and left her this, this other camp on the southern end of the lake um, in his will to her. She would later sell that camp in 1917, but it was sitting there ready for Crowley to, to use it uh, in the summer of 1916. And uh, tracking that down through... Uh, the, the ownership records as it passed through various hands. Uh, Evangeline Adams in 1917 would sell it to a friend of hers in New York who would keep it for a, a great number of years uh, until it would be sold again in the, the mid-60s, I believe, uh, to a family uh, out of Massachusetts and that remains in their, their family to this day. Uh, but consult consulting tax records, I was able to find the, the lot and go kind of confirm the... Um, at least the potential layout. It's been a hundred years, right? It is certainly, uh, it's not the little shack camp on the edge of the water that it once was, but it, it has enough characteristics where, you know, aside from uh, the, just the general kind of follow the paper trail sort of stuff uh, where we were able to, to identify it as the, the actual cabin probably stayed at. So it was, it was kind of fun to be able to do that and kind of correct the record on, um, on where Curly stayed on that summer. That's absolutely fantastic. I, what a great detective story and how amazing <laughs> it is to piece together history like that. Yeah, it's I, I love that stuff. Uh, even when I'm doing research on on magical aspects, grimoires uh, and, and the like, I love the history of of the texts. Right. To me, that that is what. Uh, really interests me. OK, we have, uh, for example, my work on the Goetia. Right. Um, where did all that come from? Right. It, it's, you know, it's clearly kind of three texts kind of glommed together um, and it almost works. But uh, where did they come from? Right. And there's there's internal references. And how do you trace those out? And, and like all those little exegetical pieces. Uh, that's what really makes me excited. I don't know why, but yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. And I think people listening to this will be really excited to hear those details and all of the work and effort you put into researching that. And I think you can see it in your work. So thank you for sharing all of that. Thanks. I hope so. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice or recommendations for someone interested in Thelema and discovering it for the first time? That is a great question. Um, Thelema is, is really uh, a very it's, it's something that's very unique to you, right? I, I guess that the way I put it in uh, kind of layperson's terms uh, is that 
What Thelema is about is figuring out who you are and doing that as best as possible and, and continually working to get better at being who you are. Uh, I, I think uh, Lon Milo Duquette, who's one of the foremost kind of Thelemic authors uh, in, in this century uh, and before, uh, has, has said you know, somewhat similar uh, words along those lines. So um, my advice is Thelema is going to challenge you. It, the whole point is for your own personal growth. Um, we we are all uh, the the grand theory here, and, and this is my you know this is me speaking. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of all Thelema here, but um, we're born kind of exactly who we are, uh, and a lot of well-meaning people try to get us to be certain things, do certain things, and and be a certain way, uh, so that we aren't kicked out of the tribe. Right. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. There, there are social conventions, there are religious conventions, there are familial conventions, um, none of which isn't necessarily us. Right. I mean, and that's that's not a huge statement to be making here. I'm not breaking new ground with that in any sense. But um, what the Lima is attempting to accomplish within the kind of the scope of individual work is peeling away all those layers that aren't you to uncover the piece that is you. And then um, reconstructing the you, <laughs> right? You're, if you're subconscious, if you want to talk about kind of Jungian terms, right? Jung described the great work, which is kind of that that concept behind the Lima as uh, the ritual cohabitation of soul and Luna, the sun and the moon. What does that mean? <laughs> well, the moon is the subconscious. The sun is the conscious self. So the art of, uh, you know, getting to know oneself or becoming oneself is when the subconscious and the conscious are the same thing, not the same thing, but reflect each other, right? Truly there's, there's no interference between the two uh, where, you know, kind of neuroses would develop, right? This is, I'm, I'm struggling with this thing because it's not true to me. Right. And when those two things are in alignment, then you are in alignment with your own universe and you are then acting from a place of balance uh, and and potency. And that's kind of, I guess, uh, my two minute riff on, on what I would suggest you kind of look towards. Um, I think the other piece is don't, um, the book of the law. <laughs> if you if you if you're interested in Thelema, uh, the Book of the Law is the central text, and it took Crowley five years to accept the first Book of the Law, the first of the three. It took him another five years to accept the second, and I'm not convinced he ever quite got to fully accept the third. So don't worry if you read at first glance and are like, ah, I don't know about this, because that's okay. I would read it as uh, an open letter to yourself. And you get to interpret it in the light of wherever you are at that time. And that takes the pressure off of, of trying to just understand it all because you won't. Crowley never did. So don't worry about it. Relax. It's going to be okay. That's fantastic advice. I, yeah, that's absolutely solid. And I wish that message could get out to more new people <laughs> that it, it is a very challenging text and not something... You know, it's something you can spend your entire life on. So, yeah. no well, stress. And, and, uh, e e right. E <laughs> equally, Crowley's works, as mentioned before, there's there, there's a ton of them. There's a lot of information out there. And he writes uh, in, in many times very kind of guarded ways and uh, isn't necessarily as clear. Uh, or, or if he's writing clearly, sometimes you're not even in the place to kind of understand that he's writing clearly. So... Reading and rereading, totally okay. And and reading multiple things to kind of inform the other, totally okay. It takes a lot of time. It really does. Um, but it's worth it. And so now to ask you sort of a more personal question, um, what authors or other works inspire you the most? Okay. Um, I'll try and do a timeline on this because I think that's kind All of right. the easiest way to go about it. I, I really love uh, the grimoire traditions uh, that emerged out of the Renaissance as um, uh, as the new learning, as it were, kind of spread across Europe. Um, and, you know, 
Arabic, Hebrew, Chaldean, uh, and, and other sources kind of emerged into the Renaissance uh, mind. I, I feel like um, that period is, is really interesting because that's where we get a lot of our initial uh, concepts of magic and, and magical practice, um, Greek uh, influences as well. So we don't have the names a lot of those uh, of those authors uh, except perhaps pseudonymously right you have solomon and, and so on right but they were not the authors of, of these things um solomonic magic is really just kind of a a, a by phrase for or a byline for um you know hebrew based magic which was based on the kabbalah and so i i really love those texts because in many ways they never should have survived uh, if you, you know, at points of, in, in the Renaissance, if you were caught with one of these treatises, you could be killed. That that just was kind of the deal. So the fact that something like Goetia still exists uh, or or the Grimoire Verum or, or any other, especially necromantic texts, the illicit texts, I'm fascinated with because these people kind of risk their lives to keep, keep that uh, information around. Um, kind of moving into... Uh, I guess it really kind of, there is a tradition of not just magical groups, but also kind of a perpetuation of that grimoire tradition that lasted even through Victorian times into the, the 1800s. And uh, there were a lot of, you know, people who traded in that, but it was the golden dawn thereafter that kind of started a new uh, tree. You know, the, the Luster Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram is, you know, today probably the best known ritual uh, of, of magical practice. That was the golden dawn. There was, there's none of that, none of that in, in the grimoire tradition. If they were going to quote unquote banish, in fact, the practice of banishing didn't exist except for, you know, they would pray before uh, uh, these, these rituals. So uh, in, in that era, I really uh, like the, the work of, of uh, Arthur Edward Waite, uh, though Crowley really had some, some issues with him and, and, to a degree, rightly so, because Wade probably took credit for um, some some lineage and some uh, you know heft where he he should not have. Um, but his work was good, even if it was really uh, synthetic in, in in as much as putting together different things. Um, so somewhat uh, in the the style of uh, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, for example, who did did likewise. Um, I, I think I could mention uh, you know Barrett is kind of. Uh, Prince Barrett did kind of something similar in, in his uh, The Magus, right, which is a, a quintessential work. So um, all that stuff is great, right? I'm trying not to name off things if people are interested in this, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I, the the seminal texts of uh, Kabbalah are really, really uh, something you, you need to at least be familiar with because much of modern magical tradition, uh, especially Western ceremonial magic, I should note, uh, is which which isn't synonymous, but uh, is, is kind of the, the tradition I'm, I'm most vested in. Uh, it's based on Kabbalah and, and they're very, very highly influenced by Kabbalah at the, at the very least. And so um, early works by Reuschlin or, or or people like that, but even through kind of modern scholarship like Gershom Sholem, who kind of initiated the modern uh, critical study of uh, mystical trends uh, So in, in uh, Jewish lore. So all that stuff uh, is is wonderful. Of course, Crowley is is right there. I really liked uh, a book that was very influential uh, and gives a great overview of the Kabbalah in the Western ceremonial tradition is Dean Fortune's Mystical Kabbalah. Can't recommend that enough. Love that work um, by far. Her her masterwork, in, in my opinion, uh, and. In the modern times, I, I think Joseph Peterson and Stephen Skinner have both done some fantastic um, uh, work over the years, and especially in the grimoire tradition uh, going forward. Um, you've got Lon Milo Duquette, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who has done um, just uh, been been such a light in the Thelemic community for so long. Uh, and a lot of his books really uh do such a great job. He was he was kind enough to the introduction to my book, um, and his two books do a great job and kind of uh, a friendly introduction to many of the topics. Um, and and I want to be want to be clear in saying like that doesn't mean he's glossing over anything, uh, but it's it's really well done in a way that's just very easy to understand. And that is is such a 
a huge skill and gift uh, to be able to do. Um, and then let's see what else. Uh, Richard Kaczynski uh, is just absolutely fabulous. I mean, I love um, every time he publishes something, I cry a little bit because it's so well done. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and I just, you know, cry, cry myself to sleep because I, 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 his level of scholarship is just, uh, uh, just incredible. Uh, and, and it is something uh, I would seek to emulate. So, uh, I know I've left a thousand people off and yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry if I didn't, you know, uh, mention you, I, honestly, anyone who's doing the work out there, good for them, uh, in terms of either writing or publishing or just, you know, practicing, I guess, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy road. So, uh, anyone's opinion is, is certainly, uh, welcome and adds the, the corpus of the work. So. Absolutely. And, you know, when someone goes, buys this book, um, what might be out is Richard Kraczynski's new book, Friendship and Doubt. And I think that's worth yes. mentioning. Um, and that's all about the free thought movement and Aleister Crowley and Victor Neuberg. So uh, that's yeah. going to be a real banger. It's coming out through um, Oxford University Press. And the amount of research yeah. he has done is astronomical. So something to keep on the horizon. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, uh, uh, take my money. <laughs> like, yeah. And speaking of the horizon, what other projects do you have on your horizon that you're excited about? Uh, a, few, a couple things come uh, to mind right off the bat. Uh, I've been actually working on a uh, something on the Abbot Tritemius, who, uh, if you're not familiar with Tritemius, Tritemius uh, published uh, a work called Steganographia, which is uh, Latin for Hebrew or hidden writing, excuse me. And it was, it's a book on, it's a book that looks like it's a book on magic, but it's actually a book on concealing writing in other writing. So like you have a, a cover text um, and in that cover text is actually a secret message hidden. Either you take say the first letter of every other word or something like that. Um, but the entire book on steganographia, this hidden writing is hidden in a book on magic. And so it's, oh, wow. it's very meta um, and it's, it's so well done and it's so absolutely brilliant. Um, but uh, it wound on the index prohibitorum like three years after its first pub publication in, uh, I believe, 1606. It had circulated in manuscript form for over a hundred years. And it's, it's really fascinating uh, in that it shows us a lot around not just kind of early cryptography, but early magical practice, because he pulled, he wasn't making this stuff up. He was actually very well versed in magical practice. And so we get a, a lens on what his view of magical practice was. And he was a staunch defender of magia naturalis, which is natural magic, with, which is effectively the study of nature, right? Um we don't know why this seed sprouts, but it does. You know, we don't know why this uh, happens in nature, but it does. Um, we want to investigate into that. That's the the you know kind of the occult nature of a seed is the fact that it hides a plant, right? That sort of thing. Um, and so, I've been working on that for a few years uh, in terms of creating a uh, a translation of steganographia, which is, is in Latin, um, but also comparing it to. Uh, it was published in 1606 for the first time, but as I said, in manuscript form for 100 years. So I have a manuscript copy of that that actually belonged to Elizabethan astrologer John Dee, uh, which is actually had been recently found in the National Library of Wales. And so doing a textual comparison of the published version versus a manuscript version uh, has been interesting as well and brings back certain red redactions and, and information around it. And so that's been a lot of fun. Um, more recently, I've... Uh, for no particular reason, taken an interest in Crowley's career as a mountain climber. Um, what, you know, long before Crowley was known as the beast uh, and and uh, so vilified, uh, he was a young boy and then young man who really liked climbing mountains um, and found himself somewhat at the epicenter of uh, British mountaineering in the late 1880s, early 1890s, well, early 1890s. And he, he would go on to climb uh, in the Alps uh, and then make his uh, attacks on both uh, K2, the second largest mountain in the world, and Kanchenhunga, which is the third largest mountain in the world, uh, long before people, you know, this was 1902 and 1905. So 
no oxygen, <laughs> no, they, they, neither of these mountains were conquered uh, for another 50 years. But he began uh, in the, the early uh, 1890s uh, climbing in Scotland and Britain at a time when most people went to climb in the Alps. If they, you were a serious climber, uh, you went and climbed in the Alps because that's where it was done. Uh, but with the advent of kind of the Victorian era and the Industrial Revolution, there, there arose a middle class who couldn't quite go take three months off in the Alps, but could spend a holiday in, say, northwestern England in the Lakes District. And where there are just these incredible peaks that you can go climb. And it, it really was, uh, he found himself unwittingly in, at, in the epicenter of the birth of British uh, mountaineering, like in Britain. Uh, so I think bringing in a lot of those ties and things like that, again, kind of historical research around, well, who were the players here, right? So um, Haskett Smith was kind of the, the, the father of it all. Uh, Owen Glenn Jones was the next one and Crowley climbed with, with Jones. Um, and and others uh, up in that area. So he was literally right there while this was happening, uh, which is just this neat coincidence um, and is mentioned in a number of uh, the climbing record books for first descents uh, of, of certain peaks and routes. Uh, so that's what I'm doing now. I want to kind of focus on similar in the vein to what Tobias Churton has done in the last uh, decade or so in, in taking segments of Crowley's life, uh, like in Berlin or Paris or wherever, uh, and just kind of narrowing that focus and saying, let's, let's talk about this right here. So I, I, I want to tease that out and kind of give some more um, uh, kind of a, a fuller treatment of, of just his mountaineering career. And I've, you know, I don't climb mountains. Like I, I the most climb I do is in and out of bed every day. So uh, <laughs> that's, so it's, it's been a fun uh, learning experience for me too. Yeah. Super interesting. Actually, just as a random, a side note about the climbing, um, so back when I was really young, like a kid, and I knew nothing about the occult and Crowley, uh, my mom randomly signed me up for a rock climbing course at like the local That's gym. Um, and we, I don't know, they just, you know, gave some like little lectures on the history of mountain climbing. And I think that was the first time I learned about Alistair Crowley was in the context wow. of the history of mountain climbing. That's so incredible. yeah, I guess I was started early there, um, unbeknownst to me. Um, so you have a lot of very exciting things going on. And if someone was interested in following your work and upcoming projects, then what is the best way for them to do that? Uh, you know, I'm kind of the worst. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of write, I, I, because I write for myself, um, mm -hmm. I really don't have like a public uh, place to be. I don't, um, or don't do a ton of social media. Uh, during COVID, I like did a bunch of tiktok series that you can you wait can you find. have a tiktok series uh, i didn't know yeah, this yeah. i think oh it's my gosh. uh yeah, yeah you can you can look me up i guess um so i did a bunch I'll of try. on the tarot and some on thelema and some on just magic and uh and whatnot um and you know i had fun with that but then i was like eh, all right it's fine but i don't have a website anymore i don't uh i, I need a person maybe i don't know but uh uh I guess keep your keep your ears peeled. <laughs> publishes, yeah, uh, what publishes you're doing something. and where to find you is occult knowledge, basically. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it comes from really just not caring. <laughs> so, but I will say, Llewellyn has a good page on yes. like your work and like yes. a, a nice little bio where to get like this book. And so people, can, I'll I'll yeah. put that in the description description for all of our listeners and viewers if you want to go check that page out and possibly stay up to date a little bit. Otherwise, uh, you know um i guess uh, uh explore that occult knowledge of, of where to find you online <laughs> well Llewellyn has done a great job uh with this book like I, I loved everything they've done with it and and for it um so you know certainly uh much appreciated all the the support that they've given uh this work and uh allowing me to talk about the lima uh, on their platform effectively Absolutely. And the cover is absolutely beautiful. Love that Isn't art. It? You can see, you can see um, in the camera, hopefully, a little bit of shine to the cover, too, which is just great. And, um, you know, and the layout is just fantastic, too. Um, show people kind of. Yeah, I, of they, the, the production value blew me away. I, I, you know, that's not on me. That's people who know how to do that. So yeah, it's fantastic. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So that about wraps up everything on my wish list to talk to you about today. Is there anything else you want to make sure our viewers take away uh, from this discussion? No, I mean, uh, if, if you buy my book, that's great. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. Go, go, um, <laughs> but other than that, um, 
do what the world should be the whole of the law. Wonderful. Thank you so much to you, Colin, and all of our viewers and listeners today. Um, as always, all of my info as well as Colin's info will be in the description. And I appreciate everyone for watching. So I am the center of expression for the primal will to good. And so are you. Thank you.